Hi everyone, my name is Matt Hamilton. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at The Ohio State University, and I'll be presenting the first half of this talk, which shares some preliminary results from a project that seeks to identify conditions for successful landscape scale conservation policy implementation in Vietnam. My colleague, Caleb Gallimore at Lafayette College will present the second half of the presentation, which focuses on how network analysis and spatial analysis can be combined to improve understanding of forest governance. And he'll also share some very interesting preliminary results from the same project, which has been a collaboration led by our colleagues from C4. This project is supported by USAID through the Partnerships for Enhanced Engagement in Research Program. So the core question that I'll focus on in this part of the presentation is what shapes collaboration between organizations that are involved in Red Plus in Vietnam? Now, as I mentioned before, the context for this work is the ongoing project identifying conditions for successful landscape scale conservation policy implementation in Vietnam. And forest governance involves lots of interactions among many different types of organizations. For example, organizations might share data or they might share information about policies. Organizations might also collaborate to jointly implement forest management projects and programs. And these interactions are important. And so we ask, what predicts collaboration among organizations? Now, in the simplest representation, we can think of these interactions between organizations as they are depicted here, as two nodes that represent organizations and a link between them, which represents collaboration. So one factor that might make it more likely for organizations to collaborate is whether they jointly participated in workshops about payment for forest environmental services programs uh, or about Red Plus. Perhaps those settings provide opportunities for representatives of organizations to get to know one another, which might make it easier for them to identify shared interests or to uh, initiate collaborative work in the future. And if that's the case, well, then these workshops might play an important role in sparking cooperation within the broader network of organizations. Another factor that might make it more likely for organizations to collaborate is whether they work in the same provinces. Being active in the same places might help organizations to get to know each other and could provide opportunities for organizations to identify shared goals and complementary resources, all of which might be expected to incentivize collaboration. And if that's true, the resulting collaborations might help organizations avoid duplication of efforts or otherwise coordinate their activities more effectively. As someone who works primarily with network data, one of the most exciting things about this research project is the unique data sets. It's not common to have information about how collaborative networks change over time. And here we're able to draw upon data from the Red Plus Policy Network Study about collaborative interactions among forest governance stakeholder organizations at three time periods. And we've also been able to access records of how organizations participated in a large number of workshops on PFAS and Red Plus over a time period that includes the three waves of collaborative network data. And finally, we're able to draw upon information about where organizations work. So all together, this is a longitudinal network with three different types of nodes, that is, organizations, workshops, and places. Now, because the data span multiple time periods, we can measure how network characteristics at one time affect outcomes in the future. And that's what this model explores. This type of model measures the likelihood of a collaborative interaction based on parameters that can vary over time. And let me just emphasize that these are preliminary results. But these results are really interesting. So let me just highlight a few of the key results from this model. First, we find that when organizations jointly participate in workshops, they're more likely to collaborate in the future. And second, when organizations work in the same provinces, they are less likely to collaborate. So what does this all mean? Well, with the caveat that these are preliminary results, 
we do find a strong tendency for collaboration among organizations that attended more workshops together. Now, workshops are important for lots of reasons. Participants can gain technical training or gain access to information, and these results highlight another function. Workshops may catalyze cooperation among participants, which can in turn help organizations contribute more effectively to forest governance initiatives. But we also observe that organizations are less likely to collaborate when they are working in the same provinces. Perhaps they seek to give one another space to carry out independent projects. We'll need to explore possible explanations for this result. But regardless of the explanation, if the result is accurate, it highlights a potential challenge to coordinated forest management. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Caleb Gallimore. I'm a geographer at Lafayette College. Um, and I'm here to talk about the second uh, part of this research. Uh, and that has to do with trying to model the relationship between network structures and PFAS and deforestation. So this is where we're really getting into impact assessment by combining network analysis and geographic information science or GIS. Uh, I should say that uh, as in the case with Matt's part of the presentation, these are very preliminary results looking at the PFAS in Vietnam and its uh, potential effectiveness on first uh, slowing the loss of extant forest patches um, and second looking at how uh, organizational activity in different provinces has affected loss of extant forest patches. Um, in both these cases, we're trying to explain deforestation of an individual 30 meter by 30 meter patch of forest. Uh, we use 30 meters by 30 meters because of the underlying data set that we're relying on. Um, that is the Global Forest Watch data set that's put together by Hansen and colleagues um, and tracks deforestation from 2000 to present. Uh, the way Global Forest Watch data works uh, was that they used the United States Landsat system uh, to classify uh, forest and non-forest pixels and to estimate the canopy cover of forested pixels as of 2000. Uh, subsequently, they identify pixels that get deforested. And so what we're trying to do is predict the probability that a given pixel gets deforested. And so what we actually do is take a random sample across all of Vietnam of 250,000 pixels that were forested as of 2000. And we combine that with another random sample of 250,000 pixels that were also forested in 2000, but were deforested by 2018. Uh, we do that in order to make sure that we have at least some pixels that were deforested as part of our analysis. So by taking that random sample, and if we can model the relationship between a range of variables and the probability of deforestation in that sample, uh, in principle, that gives us some information about what PFAS is doing to uh, older forests or forests that were present as of 2000 uh, as a whole. So to address the first research question regarding uh, PFAS's effectiveness, uh, we construct a binary variable that's one if PFAS is active in the province in which, we, uh, in which the particular pixel is found in a given year, and zero if it's not. So in other words, if you imagine one 30 meter by 30 meter forest patch, if it is in a province where PFAS is active, then the variable for that year is one. If PFAS isn't active in the province, it's zero. Um, that variable allows us to estimate the average impact of PFAS on the odds that a pixel gets deforested in a given year. And, and I'll talk in a moment about the model that we use to do that. Uh, to address our second research question, we look at the number of organizations that are enga engaged in Red Plus or PFAS as a at a national scale based on uh, C4's global comparative study on Red, <clears throat> and we look at whether or not they have activities in a given province. Now, basically the way we did that was we went through organizations' websites and looked at the projects and activities that they listed and used that to figure out what provinces they were active in. Now, the problem is that it's actually fairly difficult uh, to identify the exact time periods 
in which they were active. So we had to use a, a little bit of guesswork in that process. Um, so there's a bit of uncertainty here about uh, when exactly each organization was where. But uh, as you'll see, despite that uncertainty, we still find uh, some interesting results. Uh, the basic idea here is that we can, if we look at the organizations that are active in forest issues um, that are showing up in each province, then that allows us to sort of estimate how organizational diversity um, is affecting forest loss, with the expectation being that uh, a more diverse uh, group of organizations in a given province is going to uh, help stem forest loss. Uh, in addition to that, we have a series of control variables, um, typical variables that you would expect to affect the propensity for a forested area to be deforested. So uh, we look at the distance of a given pixel from the roads. Uh, we look at how much of the surrounding area is in cropland. We look at the initial uh, canopy closure. Um, we look at what the elevation is and surrounding terrain ruggedness, assuming that uh, more rugged terrain, it's, it's going to be a little harder or less attractive to harvest. Um, and then finally, we have random effects by PFAS region. Um, in the future, we're going to set, increase that to random effects by province as we have uh, bigger sample sizes that we've estimated. Um, so the way we're going to try to estimate our effects is to use a Cox proportional hazard model. Um, these are statistical models that are pretty commonly used in engineering and medicine. That was kind of where they originated. Um, and their purpose is to help you estimate what the relationship is between uh, a set of variables and the risk of an event occurring in a given time period. Um, so originally, they were used to model the uh, amount of time it would take, say, for a part of a machine to fail or um, for somebody to uh, succumb to a disease. Uh, in our case, we're actually using it to estimate, the, you know, to model the amount of time it takes for one of these forested pixels to get deforested. Interpreting these is um, fairly similar to logistic regression, and, and that's the way I'm going to discuss it here. Uh, the main difference is, whereas typically in logistic regression, you're looking at cross-sectional data, uh, in this case, we're looking at uh, panel data. So we have the same pixel observed over a period of 18 years, any year in which it might be deforested. Um, the reason we're taking this approach is that it allows us to model the probability that patches uh, get deforested before and after PFAS gets implemented in a province. And so that helps us deal with sort of selection effects and uh, some of the other issues that commonly make it difficult to assess the impact of policies. Um, so this gives us a nice um, efficient way to try to estimate what PFAS is doing uh, when it's going into effect. Now keep in mind, that's only going to give us an estimate of the average effect across an entire province, right? So that could in fact mean that we underestimate the effect a little bit if PFAS is only active for certain parts of a province and not an entire province. So uh, these are the results of the initial model. Uh, the way you read this is uh, that the points show the actual coefficient estimate. Uh, and the bars uh, show the 99% confidence intervals, if I remember correctly. Um, and so that shows you a little bit of the uncertainty. Uh, like in logistic regression, the coefficients are representing estimated impacts on the odds of observing an outcome. Now, uh, odds aren't quite the same thing as probability. So uh, the odds are the probability of observing deforestation divided by one minus the probability of observing deforestation. Uh, so it's sort of the ratio of the probability of seeing deforestation or not. Um, so as that ratio gets larger, uh, you're saying that deforestation is becoming more likely. As it gets smaller, deforestation is becoming less likely. Um, the coefficients here are expressed in terms of changes to the odds ratio. 
Um, so if you think about um, how we interpret these, it's that if you increase um, the given dependent variable by one, then uh, you take this coefficient and you multiply it times the odds and then that's the new odds with the increased, co uh, increased value of the variable. Um, what that means is that anything less than one, because it's multiplicative, is decreasing the odds. Anything greater than one is increasing it. If it's exactly one, there is no effect. So uh, looking at the results here, there's a few things that are quite important, right? So first, uh, deforestation declines substantially when PFAS becomes active. Um, and so we estimate that uh, there's a, about a um, 0.23 uh, reduction in the odds of a given pixel being deforested if it is in a province where PFAS is active. Uh, so that's quite substantial, right? Because again, uh, we're talking about average effects across the entire province, and we're not necessarily capturing the exact geographies or watersheds in which PFAS is active in this model. So the effect could be, in fact, uh, stronger. Uh, second, we also find a moderate decline in deforestation when additional organizations are active in the province. Now, um, that decline is a lot smaller than when PFAS goes active, but you keep in mind that in many of these provinces, we're looking at you know dozens of organizations perhaps being active in a variety of different projects, um, and that starts to add up substantially, right? So um, you know having 20 or so organizations uh, working on issues in a pro in a province would be anticipated to offset uh, odds of deforestation for these pixels that were forested in 2000 by you know roughly as much as PFAS itself going active, right? The, the good news here is that these two relationships are somewhat complementary, right? That they're not necessarily competing with each other. So uh, to summarize that, we do have evidence that the PFAS lowers rates of forest loss for forest patches that were standing in 2000. Um, there's evidence also that organizational involvement at the provincial level is associated with lower deforestation risk. Um, but there's still a lot of work to be done. So we need to increase our sample size and look at more complex measures of interorganizational network structure. Um, and so those are things that we're going to be uh, looking forward to doing uh, over the coming weeks. This is Matt Hamilton again, and I just wanted to highlight a few additional next steps that we've been pursuing. One is to complement our data on forest loss with measurements of increases in forest cover, which will give us an idea of the net change in forest cover, and in turn will allow us to evaluate the effects of PFAS on forest losses and gains. We also plan to apply network tools and perspectives to forests themselves. Now we've talked about how organizations are connected based on collaborative relationships, and forests are also linked based on connectivity of vegetation. And the level of forest connectivity has implications for ecosystem function. For example, there are species that require large contiguous forested habitat, and we hope to measure how PFAS shapes forest connectivity with resulting effects on populations of particular species. Uh, okay, now back to Caleb. Um, so uh, I know I'm not here physically, but uh, if you do have any further questions or would like to get in touch uh, to talk about these results, uh, here are Matt and my uh, emails, and uh, we'd be you know very excited to talk with you uh, more about this. Uh, again, I, I just really want to thank uh, my colleagues at OSU uh, and C4, as well as the generous support given to this project by USAID. Uh, thank you very much.